DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the St. Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation, or the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He's the author of Hidden Mountain, the Secret Garden, a Theological Contemplation of Prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of conversations, we discuss the letters of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Anthony, thank you once again for joining me. It's wonderful to be with you. I'm really excited about this series and having the opportunity to talk to you about the letters of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. It's hard for me to remember to say saint because for so many years she was blessed. But then we were at the canonization of Elizabeth in Rome. And so now she's saint. And what a blessing for the church, isn't it? Because it allows us to, any time a saint is brought forward, for us to reflect upon, to pray with, it, there is a generally a purpose in that, isn't there? A beyond just the recognition of their the sanctity of their life. Yeah, in this instance, I think you're especially right because Elizabeth of the Trinity's gift to, to the church is the gift of prayer. Those who enter into friendship with her, who read her writings, who actually in prayer ask her to help them, she helps them enter into a deep intimacy with the Lord. That's her gift, a kind of prayer we call contemplative prayer. It's a prayer uh, where you're silent before the Lord and your mind attends to him. And in this particular letter today, we find out that this kind of prayer, where this prayer of silence avails us, makes us vulnerable to a outpouring of the Lord's power in our lives. And that's such an important message today because we tend not to think of prayer as a place where we get empowered for Elizabeth and for the saints, it certainly is. In this particular letter, it is written on November 29th, 1904. And it is a letter that is written to one who she has corresponded with quite often. Yes, Father Chavignard, uh, this is the brother-in-law of, of her sister. Uh, so um, um, Margaret is married into the Chavignard family. Elizabeth of the Trinity has received special permission to write uh, uh, Father Chavignard, who at this point is not yet a priest, and he's getting ready for his ordination. And this letter is meant to be an encouragement for him as he prepares for his ordination. Anthony, I think it's important for us to appreciate the importance of extended families, particularly in that time period, that when you married into another family, they become family. Maybe we don't have that type of connection like we wish we had today, just because the families are so broken. But for Elizabeth, and continuing this correspondence, it is, in a way, like with a brother, isn't it? Yeah. That's exactly what this would be. Carmelites sometimes get permission to write priests or seminarians that they're supporting by their prayer. And, but in this case, uh, you have someone who's related by marriage. In France at this time, those kind of extended relationships would be important. But for Elizabeth of the Trinity, also her family having uh, lost her father and her grandfather Uh, Family relationships and friendships have a note of seriousness to them or commitment to them that you don't always find even in French society. She's she's someone who honors, you know, all kinds of different filial relationships. They're important to her. That would go with French society, especially the Catholic part of French society. These would be very important values. But with Elizabeth, there's a little bit of an added note. It's a theme in this letter. She sees herself and she understands prayer 
to be a, a way of deeper solidarity with those that you love. And she asserts this even as she's a cloistered, kind of cut off from the world, that she's in deeper solidarity because of the prayer that she is engaged in rather than separated from them at all. Let's enter into this letter. To Abbe Chavenard, November 29th, 1904. Providebam dominum in conspecto meo semper, quonium adextris est mihi ne commovea. Monsieur l'abbé, I am very grateful to you for your feast day wishes, and I am very happy the Church has placed our saints so close to each other, because that gives me the chance to offer you my best wishes today. St. Augustine says that love, forgetful of its own dignity, is eager to raise and magnify the beloved. It has only one measure, which is to be without measure. I am asking God to fill you with that measure without measure, which is to say, according to the riches of His glory, that the weight of His love may draw you to the point of happy loss the Apostle spoke of when he wrote, Vivo enim yam non ego, vivit vero in me Christus. That is the dream of my Carmelite soul, and, I believe, also the dream of your priestly soul. Above all, it is the dream of Christ, and I ask him to accomplish it fully in our souls. Let us be for him, in a way, another humanity in which he may renew his whole mystery. I have asked him to make his home in me, as adorer, as healer, and as savior. And I cannot tell you what peace it gives my soul to think that he makes up for my weaknesses and, if I fall at every passing moment, he is there to help me up again and carry me farther into himself, into the depths of that divine essence where we already live by grace and where I would like to bury myself so deeply that nothing could make me leave. My soul meets yours there, and, in unison with yours, I keep silent to adore him who has loved us so divinely. I unite myself to you in the emotions and profound joys of your soul as you await ordination, and I beg you to let me share in this grace with you. Each morning, I am reciting the hour of tears for you, so the spirit of love and light may come upon you to bring about all his creative work in you. If you would like, when you recite the divine office, we could unite in the same prayer during this hour that I have a particular devotion to. We will breathe in love and draw it down on our souls and on the whole church. You tell me to pray that you may be granted humility and the spirit of sacrifice. In the evening, while making the way of the cross before Matins, at every outpouring of the precious blood, I used to ask for this grace for my own soul. From now on, it will also be for yours. Don't you believe that? To achieve the annihilation, contempt of self, and love of suffering that were deep in the soul of the saints, we must gaze for a very long time on the God crucified by love, to receive an outflowing of his power through continual contact with him. Père Valet once said to us that martyrdom was the response of any lofty soul to the crucified. It seems to me that this could also be said for immolation. So let us be sacrificial souls, which is to say, true to our love. He loved me, he gave himself up for me. Adieu, Monsieur l'Abbé. 
Let us live by love, by adoration, by self-forgetfulness, in holy, joyful, and confident peace. For we are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Sister M. Elizabeth of the Trinity, RCI On the 8th, we are going to give our Immaculate Mother and Queen a beautiful feast in our souls. I will meet you under her virginal mantle. What is this dream of Christ? What is it that the Carmelite wants? What does a priest want? What should all of us want? And that is to love without measure. The measure of love is that it's without measure. The moment you begin to put measurements on love, it's not quite love anymore. And what is measureless in real love, what is measureless is your willingness to forget yourself for the good of the person whom you love. And again, the more we put limits on how much we're going to forget ourselves, the less like love it is. Love begets or engenders a desire to give yourself over for the other, any great love. That's how Elizabeth starts this prayer. It's a reflection on what it means to love greatly, to love like Christ has loved us. In these letters, particularly to this this young priest, what it seems as though she's really trying to remind him and encourage him. It's almost as though you get a sense that is he having a crisis in his walk that she's aware of, or is is this the type of encouragement that she would give to all that she would meet? He's just days away from his ordination, and actually, it's ordination to becoming a, a subdeacon. He's got a a little bit more of a road to go. There are some scandals that have broken out in the local church about whether the Bishop of Dijon is actually part of a secret organization working for its destruction. And mm. and everybody's upset about this. The seminarians are eventually going to go on strike as the scandal unfolds. And Father Chevignard is going to be right in the midst of all of this. But in this letter, what he's written to prepare for the grace of his ordination. He's written for the grace to be humble and to have a sacrificial heart. And Elizabeth in this letter is speaking right into that, but she's putting the note on love. It's a tendency we have in the midst of turmoil and and social upheaval to want to do something heroic and courageous, but sometimes we give over to a kind of vitriol or anger that isn't very helpful. And Elizabeth is aware of this. And so she wants Father Chavignard to be rooted in the love of Jesus. This is the dream that Jesus had to do everything out of love for the Father and love for us, to give himself up on the cross for us for this purpose. This kind of love that is sacrificial and its sacrifice is more loving than it is, you might say, heroic or courageous. It is heroic, it is courageous, but that's not the the first movement of it. The first movement of it is you see the plight of somebody, somebody that you really care about, somebody that God has put on your heart, and you can't be indifferent to it anymore. You need to do something. And that's what Elizabeth wants for herself and for Father Chavignard. And the reason why she wants it, because this is how Jesus gave himself up for us as well. We'll return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis in just a moment. Did you know that you can obtain a free app which contains all your favorite Discerning Hearts programs? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Archbishop George Lucas, Father Mauritius Fildi, and so many more, including episodes from Inside the Pages can be obtained on the Discerning Hearts free app. This also includes all the novenas and devotionals and prayers, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, and the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, all available on the Discerning Hearts free app. Visit the iTunes and Google Play app stores to obtain your free Discerning Hearts app today.
A Prayer for the Holy Souls in Purgatory by St. Gertrude the Great Eternal Father, I offer you the most precious blood of thy divine Son, Jesus. In union with the Masses said throughout the world today. For all the souls in purgatory, for sinners everywhere, for sinners in the Universal Church, for those in my home and in my family. Amen. Hello, my name is Deacon Omar Gutierrez, and I want to ask you to support Discerning Hearts in a special way. We, Chris McGregor, the board, and I all know that not everyone listening can help financially. We know we have listeners from all parts of the world, and we have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truths shared through Discerning Hearts totally free. So while you may not be able to contribute financially, what you can do is certainly pray, but also give us positive reviews on whatever platform you use to listen to us. If it's iTunes, Android, Stitcher, or Spotify, however it is that you get these podcasts, or if you're on YouTube and you like our videos, please give us a good rating and write a review. The more good ratings and reviews we get, the higher our profile, and the more listeners will discover us, listeners who may have the means to contribute in the future. Please consider rating us and writing a positive review today. We now return to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. You know, Anthony, there is the the passage that she cites, and she's used this in her retreats as well, that, that passage from Galatians that it's, essentially refers to, it is not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And for many, many people that, you know, I don't know if we absorb that as fully as we should, the awareness of what actually happened in the context of our baptism. It's no longer I, but he lives in me. That's good. And that's a a very powerful reflection that, that you've just had. It happens at baptism having been reconstituted in Christ, we're never the same again after that. His I, his his subjectivity, his divine person, we possess in some new way. And we're dispossessed of ourselves, our own I. Our I is given to God, and God gives us himself. And this exchange isn't just nice language. No, the Christian really possesses the eye of Christ, his, his inner subjectivity. And this informs our existence. Our personal existence now is in communion with and solidarity with Christ so that all the movements of our soul begin to be influenced by his. The selfish movements begin to die away. And these loving movements of a love that is stronger than death, a love that is filled with hope, a love that hopes for others and doesn't get discouraged, a love that is not overcome by anxiety, that love is communicated to us and it begins to change us. This is true only to to the degree that we say yes to it. It's possible to, to be baptized and even to be going to Mass all the time and resistant of this love. But for those who will humble themselves the way Elizabeth is trying to, the way she's encouraging uh, Father Chavignard to do. There's a transformation of our whole being that is possible because Christ Jesus has really given us himself. But to realize that transformation, it requires on my part a death to myself. To live by Christ, I need to die to myself. That is so powerful that when we perceive sometimes that we have to die to myself. I have to give up things to allow him. It, it's almost as though we're being told we're losing something. But it, as you've beautifully pointed out in this paragraph, it seems as though she's rallying him to understand you're actually gaining so much more. That's right. Jesus' is humanity is a humanity 
surrendered to love, completely vulnerable to love. It's the will of God, it's Jesus' will, that we live out of his transformed humanity, out of his humanity risen from the dead, out of his humanity that loved unto the end with a love that was stronger than death. That humanity is what he wants to fill us. For us to be able to receive that, our humanity needs to be surrendered to him. Let us be for him, in a way, another humanity in which he may renew his whole mystery. I have asked him to make his home in me, as adorer, as healer, and as savior. And I cannot tell you what peace it gives my soul to think that he makes up for my weaknesses and, if I fall at every passing moment, he is there to help me up again and carry me farther into himself, into the depths of that divine essence where we already live by grace and where I would like to bury myself so deeply that nothing could make me leave. My soul meets yours there, and in unison with yours, I keep silent to adore him who has loved us so divinely. When we're surrendered, when we're vulnerable, when we're open to the Lord, when we're humble before him, when we're filled with awe over his mystery, when we're, we let go of trying to be in control, we let go of trying to have things our way when we want them and how we want them. We're just surrendered to what God wants when he wants. Elizabeth says, let us be for him in a way another humanity in which he can renew his whole mystery. When we're completely surrendered the way I've just described, he can renew his whole mystery in us, his whole life-giving, God-glorifying, salvific mystery is reignited in the world again through us. But again, it requires this kind of humble surrender. In this letter, the M in mystery is capitalized. Mm. And that's important, isn't it? It's a fundamental understanding as Christians why that's important. Yeah, the mystery of Christ is saving mystery. This is the action of God. But the action of God is not separated from God himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. There isn't divisions in God. This is God who acts, and so his action reveals himself. And so this this mystery of this infinite, immense love is waiting to be born in us. It's already is being born right now. For those who are able to read this letter, you'll notice mystery is capitalized. But then if you read the next sentence, you get an understanding of how she understands this mystery. I've asked him to make his home in me as a door, as healer, and as savior. A door is capitalized, healer is capitalized, and savior is capitalized. And these are the three, you might say, main actions of Christ that Elizabeth keeps coming back to in her writings, in her great prayer to the Trinity. A few days before this, she wrote her oblation to the Holy Trinity, O oh my God, Trinity, whom I adore. It will become her most famous prayer. It's actually quoted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 260. She's the only uh, 20th century mystic and now saint who's quoted in the Catechism, who's not otherwise a pope or uh, using some kind of uh, official teaching. This prayer is so influential to so many people. And part of the reason why this prayer is influential is because of this mystery that you've pointed out. Christ wants to renew his mystery in us. What is his mystery? He wants to be in us uh, an adorer, a healer, a savior. And But the first movement is that of an adorer, somebody who is completely prostrate before, completely surrendered to, completely in awe and filled with wonder over the grandeur, the immensity, the greatness of the love of God. To taste that for a moment humbles the soul. You realize your place in the world when you come before that, the immensity of that love. 
as a soul discovers its place before God, then Christ's healing work can begin in that soul and through that soul begin to be a healing instrument in the lives of others, even to the point of helping them realize salvation. And how did Jesus save save us? He saved us by suffering for our sake. He suffered for our sake out of obedience to the Father. So obedience that suffers for the sake of love, a loving obedience, is salvific. It's on this last point that Elizabeth is going to turn her attention towards the end of this letter. In other words, a priest, a Carmelite, and we too ourselves are called to participate in Jesus' salvific work. But to do this, we need to enter into the obedience of Christ, who, um, out of obedience to the Father, uh, in the spirit of adoration, uh, in this desire to be healing, out of obedience to Father, held nothing back, but surrendered himself so that the Father could use his suffering for the salvation of the world. I'm so struck by the importance of her teaching in this, her encouragement that for all of us who are baptized into this this mystery, his mystery as she describes it, for the Christian, there is phases in our spiritual formation, as it were, and this goes back to the early Christians. There's the kerygma where you're introduced to Christ, you announce him to the world, and they accept and they want to be a part of him. And then there's that period of catechesis where we learn so much, and the catechism is kind of outlined to follow that. So you have the teachings and the creed, and then you have, you're introduced to the sacraments, then you're introduced into the moral life through the Ten Commandments and so forth. And the last part of that is prayer. You would study that, you would learn that, and then you accept it and you're baptized. And then once the baptism takes place, then you're entered into that mystery that she's speaking of. And for Elizabeth, now that you're in the mystery, this is how you navigate, and she's pointing you towards that cross, is she not? Yeah, in, in this sense, in what you just described, there's something kind of kind of mystagogical about her teaching. And, and mystagogy is a form of catechesis that leads you into a deeper immersion into the mystery of Christ. Just as you've described, it was the catechesis that were given was given specifically to those who were newly initiated to the neophytes. And so there's a way her message is addressed specifically to all of us who are fully initiated in the life of the church, but who also need to grow more intimate with him. And intimacy with Jesus involves a deeper friendship with him, knowing him more deeply. It also involves being implicated in his saving mystery. And now this is an interesting thing, though. Whenever I... I, think about that, the first thing that goes through my mind is, I'm not capable of that. I'm pretty frail. I struggle with the most basic sins almost all the time. Mm-hmm. And how is it, how could it possibly be it re, even remotely possible that the Lord would call me to something so great and beautiful? Uh, me who I, <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. kind of a, a shipwreck in so many ways. Elizabeth, in this letter, in the very next line, kind of gives us the way forward. Yes, you've been called to something great. Christ Jesus is going to give you everything you need. I have asked him to make his home in me as adorer, as healer, and as savior. And I cannot tell you what peace it gives my soul to think that he makes up for my weaknesses and if I fall at every passing moment, He is there to help me up again and carry me farther into himself, into the depths of that divine essence where we already live by grace and where I would like to bury myself so deeply that nothing could make me leave. This is just a powerful, powerful idea. As I strive to live the Christian life, as I strive to avail my humanity, surrender my humanity to God's creative action in me so that Christ's whole mystery can be renewed in me, what 
I normally experience is not a whole bunch of great achievements and uh, success stories. What I normally experience day by day, even moment by moment, is my failures, my weaknesses, my inadequacies, kind of the void of love that is in me. To have faith is to, in the very face of that, the void of love, the absence of love that ought to be there, it's not. And my little selfish foibles and weaknesses, in the face of all that, to believe that God, the mystery of Christ's love is at work in me, not despite all my failures, but right in the midst of all those failures. His love is bringing me to repentance. His love is giving me the courage and the hope to pick up and strive to go forward again. His love is at work in me, helping me be more and more confident in what God can do, so confident in what God can do that I eventually become more confident in what God can do in me than I am in confident in my ability to fail. Elizabeth is so fascinated with this mystery, it gives her confidence, it gives her peace. Here, I think, is an important thing in the spiritual life. A lot of people who are trying to make progress in the spiritual life encounter their failures, their weaknesses. Sometimes they get discouraged. Sometimes they get anxious about the fact they keep on failing and they're overwhelmed by the fact they have fallen so short of the glory of God. And in that anxiety, the disappointment, the frustration and everything, there's a tendency to want to maybe give up or just throw up your hands or wonder whether God is at work at all. And Elizabeth is saying, I have peace in the midst of my failures because I believe God is at work in them. And it's there that I'm experiencing his power unfold in my life. And she, how does she know this? By faith. She's not experiencing it in terms of something emotional or uh, has an intuition or uh, she's not imagining it. She believes this is happening by faith because of the immensity of God's love that she adores. And the more she believes that by faith, she uses a term, she says, she talks about being buried in God's presence in her. When you are buried in God's presence, the word buried here in French actually means entombed. And, and that means so dead to myself that I'm aware and the only thing that's living in me is the presence of God. I've died in the presence of God, believing in it. Even in the face of all my sinfulness and my foibles, God's power has completely entombed me so that he becomes my life. This is where peace in the spiritual life can replace some of that anxiety and frustration, discouragement, and sometimes even despair that we're inclined to. Christ's peace can be there if we let ourselves die completely to the presence of God. We turn our eyes completely to that love because that love is transformative. As we believe in that, that love will overcome our weaknesses. This concludes part one of our conversation on this particular letter of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com or download the free Discerning Hearts app located at the iTunes and Google Play app stores. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lullis.